family and uh, get started. Good to see everyone. This is Charlie Zelli, Chair of the Met Council, and this is the Green Line Extension Corridor Management Committee. Uh, welcome to the members. Just a couple of little housekeeping items that everybody knows so well. If you are having any technical difficulties, please feel free to let us know in the chat or uh, you can reach out to uh, any one of us and uh, we'll try to uh, solve that. Um, also, uh, you know, please be mindful to mute if you're not speaking. And so everybody knows we are recording this uh, meeting and it is open for the public for those that would like to review it later. And if you are a member of the public and want to make any comments, uh, please feel free to uh, email Sophia uh, Guinness, G-I-N-I-S, at metrotransit.org. We really have until uh, February 11th, and we'll include your comments in the uh, project website. And if you're interested in looking for any handouts or even the presentation, check out the website, which is Greenline. EXT. That's just one word, greenline, ext.org. So it was a way to start the meeting and uh, welcome everybody. Why don't we introduce ourselves by organization or local government? And if I name the organization, maybe people can jump in and uh, introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Matt Council. Molly Cummings, Met Council, District 5, Hopkins, Edina, Richfield, and Bloomington. Great, Molly. Anyone else? Any other members? All right, how about Hennepin County? Good morning, everyone. Debbie Gotel, Hennepin County Commissioner, District 5, Bloomington, Richfield, and most of Eden Prairie. Um, very glad to be on this and hear the great updates. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Chris Latonders here, Hennepin County Commissioner for District 6, representing Hopkins, Edina, Northern Eden Prairie, Minnetonka, and 12 communities around uh, Lake Minnetonka. Welcome. Irene Fernando is here, but I'm actually seeing multiple colleagues, so I, I think I'll depart. Yeah, no, um, are you, are you going to depart? Okay, you'll intro yourself and depart. Okay, hi everybody, County Commissioner, District 2 and Rail Authority Chair. Just wanting to make sure we were uh, good on our side. Thank you so much, Commissioner Fernando. Um, good morning, everybody. It's Marion Green, um, Commissioner from District 3, uh, which is Southwest Minneapolis and St. Louis Park. And as Commissioner Fernando has alluded, uh, all four of us cannot be here and I'm an alternate. So I will depart and I look forward to an update in another time. Good to see you, Commissioner Green. We'll fill you in. <laughs> okay, how about Eden Prairie? Eden Prairie? Minnetonka. Good morning, uh, Brad Wiersum, Mayor of Minnetonka. It's good to be with you all. Hey, Mayor, good to see you. Uh, Hopkins. Hi, good morning, Patrick Hamlin, Mayor of Hopkins, and I think I'm joined by Council Member uh, Hunky and Kirsten Elvram as well. And good morning to everyone. Welcome. St. Louis Park. He'll be getting on within about 10 minutes. He has to do a press conference at City Hall, and so he said he'd be getting on shortly. Perfect. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, Mayor, since you've You've popped up. How about Edina? Yeah, Edina is here. Jim Hovland. Good to see you. Uh, yeah. I could represent Baja Edina, Eden Prairie, too, if you want me to. Sure. <laughs> uh, anyway, he was here from Minneapolis. Minneapolis. How about MnDOT? I'll see anybody in Metro Transit. Morning, Chair. Nick Thompson, Deputy General Manager, Metro Transit. Hi, Nick. How about the Community Advisory Committee? 
Assad anyway uh, with the New American Development Center. Welcome, Assad. And last but not least, the Business Advisory Committee. Tony Terzelli and all. Uh, Will Roach, co-chair with the Business Advisory Committee. Welcome, Mark, Dan. Good morning, Dan Duffy, the other co-chair on the Business Advisory Committee. Hey, Dan. Okay, did I miss anybody? All right, hearing none, we have a full agenda and plenty of opportunities for comments. But first, uh, the minutes were sent out Tuesday for review. And uh, if there are any edits, please let me know. I think uh, Dawn actually has an edit already uh, in her scope. So uh, uh, Dawn, maybe you could share that. Yes, it was noted that um, on the minutes from December 1st, on the last paragraph under number four, the dollar amount should be 1.6 billion. I had 1.6 million. So the sentence should read, Commissioner Latandris commented that the dollars spent for redevelopment has already been 1.6 billion. Just a few decimal points. Yes, okay, great, thank you. Good catch. Any other edits? And if not with that one edit, uh, I would, uh, uh entertain a motion to approve and a second Move. thank you mayor hovland is there a second second go tell thank you commissioner uh and with that dawn would you please call the roll council member cummings aye commissioner latandris aye commissioner Gotel. aye Commissioner Fernando? Aye. Mayor Hovland? Aye. Mayor Hanlon? Aye. Mayor Wearsome? Abstain. Um, Will Roach? Aye. Dan Duffy? Aye. Asad Elawid? Aye. And Chair Zelli? Aye. Those minutes are approved. Um, so uh, I just want to make just a few brief comments um, and because we want to get into um, a lot of the uh, substance of our agenda. But uh, no, uh, no mystery here. Last week was really a uh, big week for the project. Um, first, I really want to thank all the committee members uh, for your expressions of support encouragement, keeping this project moving forward. We all recognize its value. Um, and, um, and clearly, uh, we are all disappointed uh, at the delays uh, that we anticipate. Um, and then with that, the associated costs. This is frustrating, I think, for everybody, uh, particularly those of us and any of you, all of you who have been uh, so encouraging and and for you know decades to advance this really important project. Um, I think it's best uh, interest for the region that we uh, try to keep get this open as soon as possible so we can talk more about the uh, steps we're taking to assure that uh, happens. Um, but also we really want to uh, address the issues of uh, the increased uh, associated costs due to the to the, the delay, this is something we really fairly project team takes very seriously. And, um, and uh, we are at a point now uh, where uh, we can really go into details about uh, what we are seeing and what we anticipate. Um, also, uh, when you think about this project that's gone through so many phases of early planning back in the 1980s, um, and the first right away was purchased uh, by the Hennepin County Regional Rail Authority. It's been a vision that I think we uh, have always uh, stayed true to advancing the work despite the complications and despite the uh, kind of the, uh, the, the challenges that this particular line has had. Uh, but it's really, um, it's really notable that uh, we've really been, I uh, hate to say that this is not a pun, but we've been in alignment. We've been in alignment to uh, really advance 
and recognize the importance that this this line has to the larger kind of interconnected transit system for the whole metro area. So before we really get into it uh, and hear a presentation, I just want to open it up and see if there's any additional questions from uh, CMC members um, and any questions, comments that anybody might have at this point. I'd be curious what uh, you all are hearing from your own communities and businesses and maybe a secondarily, uh, is there any way uh, we can support you in, uh, as we kind of think through these next steps? Chair Zelly, Brad Wilson. Sure, go um, ahead, Mayor. You know, it's, it's interesting. I have not heard that much from my community but clearly people who oppose the project are using this opportunity to tell us their opinion and how wrong we were to uh, pursue this. And um, while the news that we've had is disappointing, um, these are, you know, these are, these are significant bumps in the road, but they're bumps in the road. And strategically, and the reason we are pursuing this project and why it's so important for not just the cities along the line, but for our entire region continue to be valid. And so, you know, I'm heartened by that. You know, got, you know, we all in elected office get a few nasty grams every once in a while. That comes with the territory. But um, overall, I haven't heard that much. Um, and, you know, it's the, uh, uh, the, the bad news, the negative shots are kind of from the usual suspects. So um, it is what it is. Um, if we were right strategically, and we are, um, let's let's stay positive and march forward. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Mayor Havlin, I you might be muted. I, are you speaking? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I was muted. Um, I know that uh, Mayor Spano has some. Uh, has had some uh, interactions with people in his community. And when he gets on here, it may be a little out of sequence, but I think he may want yeah. to address some of these issues that have arisen that are that are of concern to him. And then also maybe revisiting uh, even some of those initial decisions that were made years ago about the, the route selection process and, uh, and, and maybe just a, a, a reminder of why the, uh, the um, the, the corridor down through um, uh, the Greenway and up Nicollet was not going to be as viable as the one that was chosen through the Kenilworth corridor, the freight reroute, you know, so there may be some folks out there that Mayor Wearsom alluded to that need some reminders of, of why the route was selected that we selected. And let's not forget, and I'll join Mary Wearsom in saying, uh, it, it, the line doesn't run through Edina. And so I'm, I'm actually grateful that I was a, a voice that could be, our community had a voice here that in a way is more objective. And uh, I joined Mayor Wearsome in saying, and a reminder everybody, this is the largest public works project in the history of the state of Minnesota. And there are going to be, as he said, bumps along the way and uh, some troublesome spots. And I think that uh, we're gonna see a cost expenditure uh, over what was anticipated in the neighborhood of, um, what 400 500 million dollars we're going to figure out how to solve that issue uh and we'll do it together and maybe in conjunction with the federal government but uh, i think we need to move full speed ahead this is going to allow us to put a system in place in the twin cities we're going to end up with a tremendous light rail system that makes us a, a globally significant player from an economic development standpoint um for those folks that want to back out of this thing or are uh, criticizing the decisions that were made. Uh, I think some of them are the same suspects. There may be more, but uh, just a reminder, and I had this conversation yesterday with Commissioner Latondras, that um, uh, we would stand to suffer a, quite a significant penalty in the $1 billion range uh, from the federal government if we decided to try to unwind this thing and then try to uh, unwind it would cost several hundred more million and we've already expended, uh, as you indicated in the minutes, a billion six. So, we need to we need to deal with these problems that are in front of us, solve them, keep moving forward, 
and get this thing done. And uh, over the next hundred years, this is going to serve our metropolitan region very effectively. Thank you. Well, thank you for that comment. And uh, we'll certainly give space for uh, Mayor Spano when uh, when he's uh, when he's able to join us. But uh, any other uh, any other comments, questions? I will say, and we're going to hear from uh, Jim Alexander here in a minute, but, uh, you know, the idea of actually having an agreement uh, in place that we can now have a schedule to create uh, accountability in a way that uh, uh, can be transparent and, uh, and, is, and is real, given the issues we're facing, uh, is a, it's a really important step. Because uh, you know this has been a very complicated negotiation to reconfigure this project, and uh, having witnessed some of this work, it has not been easy. But it's a, we're at a phase now where we can be um, much more um, open, and uh, though disappointing, uh, it's real, and it's a way that we can get our arms around this project the best we can to protect taxpayers and the schedule. Because um, if we did nothing, um, it could be much, much worse. But I see Mayor Spano is joining us. Um, Jake, do you have a comment? We were just asking for questions, comments, and uh, we thought you might have an important point of view on this. <laughs> well, I apologize for being late, Chair. I was uh, participating in a <clears throat> uh, press conference for uh, MTCA here that's being held just right in the next room here. So I had to step out from that, but I appreciate giving me the opportunity. I. Um, um, and I don't know, again, not, you know, I imagine that you all have obviously done a few things, but I'm not sure if you've done your presentation or Jim's done his. I'm happy to hold my comments, you know, for after presentations are done. I don't need to jump in front of the line. No, not at all. We're just opening it up for initial okay. comments. Uh, uh, Jim has uh, just about to start, so we could, uh, if you want to see anything now or wait till later, uh, we're. we're oh, I'll, I'm happy to wait. Uh, I'd, okay. I'd love to hear kind of where, yeah, I'd love to hear Jim's presentation and that may answer some of my questions. So Sure, let's, uh, I know a lot of questions are going to be answered, so this is an appropriate time. Uh, everybody may know, but the Metro Greenland Extension Project Director, Jim Alexander, has been on the, uh, he's been on the mission for uh, many years and I've had his, this, uh, uh, been able to know Jim uh, when I was Commissioner of Transportation and know some of the work he was doing on the early, early work. So, uh, Jim? Take it away. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, advance the slide there. Okay, so we we have talked about uh, our challenges on this project, and uh, you know, there's there's really we've been talking mostly about two key issues, but there's really three issues at hand that we've been dealing with our civil contractor, London Macross and Joint Venture, on this, and that's uh, it's kind of really why we're where we are today in terms of getting looking at a settlement agreement. So the first the first is the quarter protection wall. We've talked uh, about this quite a bit. Uh, you can kind of see in the lower lower left that's uh, what the wall looks like um, under the under the Van White uh, Boulevard um, uh, bridge there. That's where Bassett Creek Valley Station will be located. And as we've talked, this is a requirement for BNSF, and uh, we were going through environmental clearance at the really at the same time we were out for bid on the civil construction project, and we all went into this knowing that uh, we would add this as a change order. Uh, however, we didn't expect the cost to be as much as they were, and uh, we didn't expect that there would be uh, the uh, impact to the schedule, or the construction schedule, as uh, as we have been. Uh, uh, working with the contractor. So the next item, next slide six, please, is uh, this is really our, our challenge, the Canterbury Tunnel and uh, the secant pile. We talked about this, that uh, we have to do a secant pile along uh, where the condominium buildings are located at the court, toward the south end of the half mile or so tunnel. And uh, this, this uh, because of that, it's really impacted the tunnel sequencing. I've taken some of you out on tours to show you what this thing looks like. Uh, I think we have a video actually, we're gonna show what uh, what goes into the components, but uh, it's a challenge. And uh, I'll just say that it's been, it's more of a challenge than when we anticipated when we were sitting around the drawing table with our engineers looking at this and trying to figure out how we're gonna get this tunnel through. Uh, it's a, uh, 
it's it's a big bear and uh but we're going to get through it and uh this is part of the uh part of the reason why we're at the uh at the settlement agreement table with the contractor uh next slide please so here's some images of, of what that uh, tunnel is looking like, the construction. You can see the, the condominium towers off in the distance on the image to the left. And uh, on the right is uh, the contractor installing the, the secant pile wall uh, next to that uh, condominium structure. Next slide, please. So this third component, we haven't really talked a lot about uh, other than we added this to the project uh, uh, post bid. Uh, the city had a CMAC grant and uh, and so this was added to the project. The contractor has cited this as a kind of a third primary element of adding to their work that has uh, disrupted their, their schedule in terms of getting their original bid plan uh, done on this project. Again, 14 and a half miles that the civil contractor needs to Needs to uh, needs to complete. Um, this station is is pretty far along, as you can see in the image there. That's uh, earlier this winter, uh, with the construction course system still needs to come out and do the work as well. So next slide, please. So as I indicated, uh, you know a lot of unexpected, but uh, you know we're 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 taking a lot of heat on this thing, and uh, you know we'll continue to to take that heat until this thing gets done. But uh, I'll tell you that. Uh, you know, we have we have a lot of smart uh, consulting engineers working on this project. Uh, we pretty much have uh, most of the engineering uh, firms in the region working on on our project in some fashion or another, and uh, we rely on those engineering consultants to help guide us on uh, what we're doing here. And uh, we feel like uh, we still this is a good plan, and we will get this uh, thing done. But it, it is complicated, as we'll show you with the uh, with the, the video coming up. Next slide, please. So we tried to uh, simplify this a little bit because I know last time we talked in December and as I mentioned, you know, we have the civil construction contract, but we're not done there yet. We need to get to systems as well, but uh, we had the original civil construction schedule and cost that uh, that uh, that bid came in just under 800 million. And we had a schedule set to get that done in towards uh, 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 later this year, originally planned. But because of those issues, we uh, we need to revise that uh, schedule. And uh, so we're adding some months to that uh, civil construction schedule. But this is going to be done through an agreement and what we're calling a settlement agreement. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the outcome of that will be a revised construction schedule for the civil construction and uh, associated costs. So maybe the, a bigger picture on the next slide here is uh, we're here essentially with that revised construction schedule. We think we've uh, landed on that number in terms of what we're, we're looking toward agreement on and uh, as long with the schedule. But the next step is we need to get uh, a revision of the system schedule because the systems is all reliable, reliant on the civil construction. Essentially, there's a, there's a kind of a, a, a handoff, if you will, of the areas that are constructed by a civil contractor that eventually needs to be handed off to the systems contractor to do their work. And the systems, you may recall, that's the catenary system, that's the all the cabling, all the communication uh, pieces that need to be installed, traction power, substations, signal houses, that type of thing. But we're not done there yet after we get the systems done. We need to understand what our supporting contracts need to be amended to uh, see us out through the ultimate uh, um, build out of this project. And there's testing and uh, just getting all those pieces uh, put together. Now we're working all this in parallel, but we really has to start with the civil to understand what the system is gonna do, to understand what the testing and the ultimate uh, schedule is gonna look like. But uh, ultimately it gets us to a revised project opening day and cost. Next slide, please. So with the introduction of these, uh, these issues, we actually brought on a uh, uh, independent expert, uh, Venable, I mentioned that in the past. Uh, we brought them on uh, about a year and a half ago as I was actually seeing that we had some issues with, uh, with uh, trying to get the civil construction done and said, we need some help. So we looked uh, to, to the MnDOT model and uh, we brought on, brought on a company called Troner that uh, helped MnDOT through the St. Croix project. They are a claims expert and look at scheduling and costs. 
But through that process, we end up getting a, a firm called Venable who works on these type of mega projects. Ken Roberts is in charge of, of, of the work that we're the, the, on this project. And he is uh, well-versed on in working on uh, mega projects throughout the United States as well also uh, abroad. Uh, next slide, please. So what we've done so far is that uh, we uh, we sought uh, approval from our Met Council back on Wednesday last week to enter into a settlement agreement. So that essentially allows us to negotiate and execute the settlement agreement. And the next step we took later on uh, at the end of last week as we went to the Executive Change Control Board to approve and advancing that settlement agreement. Now, the Executive Change Control Board, maybe recall, is made up of uh, county commissioners, uh, Chair Zelli and uh, and uh, we have uh, Councilmember Cummings on that as well. And, uh, but we have another step to, to make at a, at a future meeting, Executive Change Control Board meeting to consider for final approval, the negotiated settlement and the use of up to $210 million in contingency. And I wanna pause on that a moment because we're, we're not necessarily saying that our settlement agreement is going to land at 210. We are going to go through an evaluative mediation process on issues that we don't uh, agree with. We'll come up with an assessment of what we think this is worth to settle with the contractor. The contractor will have their number and we're gonna to meet to see if we can get to agreement on that, but areas we don't come to an agreement, that'll go through a mediation process. And ultimately, if the mediation process doesn't solve the problem, it'll go through arbitration. So I wanna point out that th this number could end up being less than 210. It could possibly be more than 210. We are hopeful that we keep it uh, well under 210, but this uh, allows us to encumber up to that amount through this process. If we have to go uh, above that 210, we will go back to our council for approval authority as well as the ECCB. Uh, next slide, please. So the principles of the uh, agreement framework, it really establishes that discrete resolution process that I mentioned. And uh, we feel like this is really something that can uh, 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 really validate the numbers. So, you know, we're just not making it up and we have someone looking over our shoulder to, to make sure that, uh, okay, it, it ends up being the right number. And again, if that doesn't get resolved through a mediator through that process, it ultimately goes through a binding arbitration process. But what this does is uh, establishes a new civil construction schedule, which we really need. The contractor has been working uh, with, with in good faith over the past year without really a schedule that is workable. We have the original contract schedule in place in the contract. We need a new schedule into the contract. And the purpose of this whole settlement process is to get that, uh, get that schedule established. Now, people have been asking us, well, how come you didn't know this? Why, you know, why couldn't you figure this out in January? We have been negotiating with the contractor over the past year to get to this new schedule. There's been a lot of back and forth. We've had the Toronto folks, we've had our internal folks looking at this, really, really trying to uh, kick the tires, so to speak, on, on the schedule to make sure that we can get a schedule that is not only doable from the contractor's perspective as well as ours, but uh, it's, it's also fair. We don't want to, uh, we don't want to be uh, allowing the contractor to be out there too, too long and then paying too much. It's, it's kind of a right fit here. But it also defines this, this agreement defines the, uh, the payment schedule for the costs. And uh, really most importantly, this, uh, this path avoids potential litigation. And I think, you know, we go to litigation, really nobody, nobody wins. We see that in Maryland, where the Maryland project essentially paid $250 million to the contractor as they left the project and they're gone. So that's just a check that just goes out the window, so to speak. And they still have more costs to deal with. We are, we are avoiding this process uh, of litigation process through this agreement uh, 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 framework process that we have established. Next slide, please. So what the schedule does, it adds uh, a little over 34 months to the civil construction schedule. So that will bring us to uh, toward the uh, September or third quarter of uh, 2025 to finish that. And the, uh, the LRT tunnel is really the long lead item and that's looking to be done in that earlier part of 2025. I know I've, had a, I've already been getting a lot of questions about uh, well, what little components, the trails and uh, roadways and bridges, when are those gonna be open? We are still getting that sorted out and we'll be able to maybe talk about that a little more fluidly um, uh, in terms of what individual components will be done when. 
but uh, we 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 essentially have the uh, the overall schedule I think uh, uh, nailed down at this juncture, uh, subject to getting the settlement agreement signed, and this uh, really realigns the sequence uh, for which the uh, different various construction segments are completed. It's 14 and a half miles long. There are a number of segments that uh, have their own completion dates. Uh, that uh, were in the original contract, those will be revised uh, per this uh, per the settlement agreement. And uh, we we really have been very cognizant of trying to understand how that uh, handover is going to be from from the si civil contractor to the systems contractor. Very important. We have a fluid motion there. The systems contractor has been working with us. They're starting to develop their schedule as well. And uh, we think we have a pretty good handle on where they're going to be, but there's still negotiation with that uh, with that uh, uh, contract as well. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll use this uh, dispute resolution process to resolve the costs eventually. And uh, these they're really around these four these uh, five categories: There's extended performance. So if I'm going to finish a project on on year one. And now I have to finish that project in year three. There's going to be additional costs associated with that because there's going to be the people involved in that project that are still on the job. And so that's the that's where this category comes to play, where we would be uh, essentially compensating the contractor for being on the project longer than originally anticipated. There's going to be labor and material escalation where. We're really seeing that uh, it's it's just uh, kind of gone crazy out there with some of the commodities, and uh, and uh, we're trying to get uh, get our arms around that as best as possible. We do have uh, have some really uh, really good consultants that that look at uh, the costs of construction costs here and uh, really understand what is fair and uh, at reasonable. So we'll be uh, getting that negotiated, get that piece negotiated as well. Subcontractor costs, that's a big component. There are, no, there are a whole slew of uh, subcontractors subcontract, on this, uh, on this uh, civil contract, uh, a lot of DBEs involved. So we wanna make sure that the subcontractors are getting compensated as well, not just the, uh, the prime, uh, prime contractors. We also wanna close out known change orders. Uh, these are changes that have uh, kind of been in the queue that haven't been executed. And we wanna get those uh, uh, processed through this, uh, through this mechanism so we can hopefully go on as clean slate as possible. There may still be some change orders that need to be cleaned up, but I would, would advise that there are going to be more change orders on this project. It's just a function of uh, this work. You know, going back to the green line, we had over 1,700 change orders all told for four contracts. Change orders will happen on these type of projects anytime you get into construction. But the intent here is really to get the, the backlog, if you will, of change orders behind us and get that into, uh, into place. And the last one, just the impacts to product productivity uh, work performed to, per date. An example of this is that uh, when we were driving piles around uh, in Eden Prairie, around Shop HQ, we had to work at night uh, to avoid impacts to that facility because they essentially recorded um, almost 24 seven, but there was a respite from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. that we could do our work. We had to do a lot of reconfiguring to kind of figure out how we could get those pile, that pile work done. We eventually got it done, but there was a productivity impact to the contractor because there's a lot of starts, stops and starts to get that work going. Next slide, please. So overall picture, I think this is the, you know, the big piece that's uh, really been kind of hitting people hard as well as us is that uh, we, are, we are projecting opening day in 2027. Uh, we, we hope that's a, that's a conservative date. Um, as I said, we are still in the process of, uh, of finalizing a system schedule. So we don't know fully exactly when that's going to be done, but we think within the 2027, we can make that date with, uh, with what we've seen so far. The other piece I've, I mentioned is the, is the uh, testing. And I've talked to some of you about, we're, we're really looking at seeing how we can modify our testing program to, to kind of work within the, the schedule. We know the tunnel is a long lead item. So we are looking at the idea of uh, getting testing done from both ends, west to the tunnel, and then from target field 
going over toward 394. They, we think that would be uh, advantageous for the project as a whole to get to revenue service earlier and it's something we're working with our operations folks. So I'm just advising this is going to be in the future, but um, we hope at some point that we're out testing trains on the West End, but we won't be yet in revenue service. So that's going to be uh, something we'll have to manage from a communication perspective. But we see that as, uh, as being able to, you know, you know kick the tires again, get the bugs out, because the testing is something that's really a lot of unknowns going into it, to, and things things are going to go wrong, and we need to we need to have time to, to fix those issues that come up. It's just a lot of software issues, and a lot of connect, connect connectivity issues that need to get resolved. But we think we can achieve by 2027 to get to that uh, uh, final final opening day there. So next slide, please. So a lot of questions about uh, where's the money coming from. We will need more funds for this project. Um, we have uh, we have under, undergone cutting measures in the past, which I'm sure well you all well know that we cut the OMF, for example, from the OMF or for, from from Hopkins. And uh, but we're uh, we're over 60 percent uh, completed on this project, and uh, get a lot of questions. Well, can we just stop? Well we can't just stop there's a lot of infrastructure that's already been built to to kind of retract from where we are today we essentially have to for example we'd have to rebuild the um, the uh, the glenwood avenue bridge take away all the components we 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 built in the in the bnsf quarter that's as per our agreement with bnsf we had to put it back to original condition that would just be money uh money uh just uh, kind of floating in the wind there a little bit. We don't really want to, that, that's just really not uh, not a feasible alternative. Uh, another question we've been probably anticipating is that uh, we, we're not going to be seeking uh, funding from city partners back in, I think, 2015, where we were, uh, we were uh, looking for, uh, for funds uh, to, to get us uh, lifted up from where we were at that time. Uh, we are working with our, with our funding partners. There's FTA, there's the county, and we're also working with the governor's office on this. So, uh, but uh, we still have more work to do. And I don't know if I want to pause there, Mr. Chair, if you wanted to say any, any words on that. No, I uh, I agree uh, uh, with you and the project team that we are really committed with our partners to uh, marching forward and and solving the um, funding gap, but most importantly, to finish the project. So, um, and that's uh, the most prudent um, uh, course uh, for all parties, uh, and especially for the economy of uh, the region and Minnesota. All right, maybe next slide, please. So just a little comparison about how that uh, matches up with other peer groups. Uh, you know, we, we have been pretty consistent on our projects being uh, Houston. We're, we're well under those, uh, you know, cost per mile, if you will. Our previous, uh, um, uh, with our previous numbers at 2.2, I think we're just a little over 150 million per mile. With the revision of we're forecasting, um, between 450 and 550 million dollars more needed, needed more on this project. We're in the range of 180 to 190 million dollars per mile. Peer projects running well above that, 200 to 500 million. And just want to, uh, not to put that as an excuse. Just want to put it up for perspective. Next slide, please. So a uh, little bit of construction highlights. We did cover a little bit this back in December, but uh, just kind of remind you folks, uh, we will be coming out with uh, 2022, um, uh, what's gonna be happening, but that's gonna be our at more likely our next meeting. But uh, just remind folks that uh, we are pretty far along here. We're 60% complete on the civil construction, about 62 actually. And the systems contractor is actually starting to do work out in the field. A lot of work behind the scenes on that contract uh, because there's a lot of design build effort uh, getting some middles done, but they're up and raring to go. And then prior to revenue service is that testing piece. We gotta make sure that everything's tested out and, uh, and make sure it's safe before we can get to uh, final revenue service and get the public on the trains. Next slide, please. So I think I did show this last time, but just kind of reminder of what uh, has been done in terms of accomplishment. Um, we, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're moving along here. Next slide, please. 
we have 11 and 16 stations in place. You can see some of the imager, imagery here. And I would just put out, uh, you know, as we start getting into the spring, if uh, put out if anybody's interested in doing tours, I'd be more than happy to do that. We had some uh, good tours last fall and into the winter. Next slide, please. And Sophia, I think we're going to show the video here for the tunnel. Yes, Jason's getting it queued up for everyone. The Kenilworth LRT Tunnel is a 2,870-foot structure that stretches from just east of West Lake Street to just south of the Cedar Lake Channel. Once constructed, the tunnel will run under Cedar Lake Parkway as well as the Kenilworth Trail. The tunnel is being constructed using a cut-and-cover method, where a trunch is first excavated to construct the tunnel, and after the tunnel is constructed, it is then covered up. The tunnel is divided up into 30 segments or cells that are generally 100 feet in length. There are different construction activities going at any one time in seven consecutive cells, creating a work area over 700 feet long. During the excavation phase, soil is removed from three different cells simultaneously, and the contractor installs a series of supports called struts and whalers to provide additional support to build the tunnel. Strut placement slows excavation because materials and equipment have to move around them. Due to tight site access, excavation progresses in a specific linear way to remove and transport soil to other parts of the corridor. The excavation extends about 15 to 20 feet below the water table, further slowing the process as it is more difficult to scoop and place saturated soils. Additionally, divers must check the sheet piles for gaps and make repairs as necessary. This all occurs in a work site that is only about 50 feet wide. Construction of the tunnel involves pouring concrete in six different phases, each needing time to cure before the next phase of work can start. Once excavation is completed in a cell, a concrete tremi seal ranging from 4 to 10 feet in thickness is poured underwater to create an anchor for the tunnel structure and seals off the excavation from groundwater so the tunnel can be constructed in dry conditions. After the water is removed from the cell, the sheet piles are sprayed with concrete to create a uniform surface. A layer of concrete is poured on top of the rough tremie surface to create a level surface for tunnel construction. The struts and whalers are removed and a concrete slab is poured to create the tunnel floor which will serve as the final surface for the track bed and rails. The tunnel walls and ceiling are poured in one concrete pour in about 30 foot long segments. A final topping layer of concrete is then poured. The finished tunnel includes a waterproof membrane to prevent water from entering the finished tunnel and steel rebar to make it structurally sound. The access constraints limit the opportunity to work simultaneously in multiple cells. There is generally only one concrete pour that can take place on a day. This is more challenging because of the inability to access the tunnel site from the west end of the corridor due to the construction of the secant pile wall adjacent to the Cedar Isle condos. As the work progresses across the parkway, about one cell is completed per month. Project staff remain committed to providing frequent updates to the community regarding this work. For the most up-to-date project information, please visit greenlineext.org. All right. Um, Mr. Chair, I saw in a comment that there might be an interest in seeing Thank some Thank you, everybody, for projects. joining us today. We're going to talk uh, about Seattle the Blue Paper Line extension and our draft route modification chair. report. We'll, we'll, we'll get um, that out to folks. Just that so here we can get back to the PowerPoint there. All right, next slide, please. Well, I think it's important to remind folks why we're here. I think it was mentioned earlier in the in the meeting minutes. We're we're actually getting closer to two billion dollars of development uh, already occurring or in the planning stages being approved on this project. Oh, we're uh, here. We go. Uh, so, in terms of the the construction, in terms uh, seventy five percent of the Minnesota counties have someone bringing a paycheck home on this project. That's pretty significant. You see the stats here. I won't necessarily go through them all, but uh, to point out the DBE. There's something we we uh, we we chart very closely on all our projects, all our contracts, and uh, the civil construction currently running 
just under 21% uh, over the 16% goal. Next slide, please. So in terms of upcoming uh, community outreach, uh, we have a lot of uh, pieces happening uh, later this uh, spring and fall, but as I said, we'll, we'll kind of ramp up uh, tours, uh, not only for folks on this, uh, on this committee that want to do that, but uh, for the public. And we'll be doing town halls to talk about uh, what's going to be happening in construction this year and uh, through also pop-up events. And we do have, uh, looks like we're scheduled to be at uh, various city council um, meetings to give a presentation uh, to the individual uh, uh, cities uh, later in March. And we will continue with our, our uh, weekly construction updates. We're doing uh, every other week right now while construction is a little slowed with the chilly weather, but, uh, but we'll advance that up to weekly uh, once we get uh, into the spring and start uh, ramping up in construction. So I think that with Mr. Chair, I think that's with, uh, that's the end of my presentation here. Great, thank you, Jim. And uh, why don't we take the presentation down and just open it up for uh, some additional questions. And I invite everyone to uh, show, if you're comfortable, show your, keep your video on so we can see each other, just at least during these conversations. Um, and I'll open it up. Uh, Jim, I really appreciate it. This is a lot of information that gives greater clarity about the pathway forward. Um, it is much about the process as it is uh, the substance of what we're facing. Um, but uh, does anybody have any questions or uh, comments or feedback? Uh, Commissioner Gotell. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Zali. And thank you, uh, Jim, for that presentation and going over this. Some of this is repetitive, but it's always good to hear a lot of this information again because there's so much to it. It's a very meaty subject, and we've been through this before, so I appreciate that. I have talked to some reporters and I um, had talking points and very similar to what was in the PowerPoint when I spoke to, to them. But one question they asked that I, I would like an answer to is they asked, well, the trains are already here. Are we going to do some testing? But are, because they're going to be sitting for such a long time, are we actually going to run them on the other tracks? Are we going to put them on the other lines and um, utilize them for some period of time? Or are we just going to keep them in storage? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. Yes, that's a good question. We have 26 of the uh, trains here. There's still one out in Sacramento at the Siemens factory. So they're undergoing commissioning. We're also uh, doing some, uh, uh, um, adding some advanced or some uh, more robust uh, camera security uh, elements to those. And uh, we have committed as Metro Transit that we would get that uh, equipment on before we'd uh, use these trains in revenue service. But the intent is that uh, once that is all done, we will have those trains out in service. Given the given the, the COVID situation, the supply and demand issues, the supply chain, we've been uh, a little challenged in getting all that equipment on our trains. But as soon as that happens, we will uh, put those out in revenue service in advance of, of the Green Line extension opening up. Great, thank you. Any other uh, questions, comments? Feedback? Uh, Mayor Spano. Thanks, Chair. Um, Jim, thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, I do want to kind of go back just a little bit, Jim, because I think obviously there's a lot of interest and attention that's been devoted to the announcement that came out here a little bit ago. Um, and I appreciate the information that you shared. I guess I, I want to dig a little bit deeper into understanding how we kind of uh, got to where we're at. And, and you may have answers to these things. You may need to circle back and I'm happy to circle back. Um, but I think uh, questions around, you know, when we went for, uh, for example, uh, I, I think that one of the issues that I remember vividly back when we had our, our last budget challenge uh, was going from preliminary to final engineering on project on the project and i remember the very big budget increase and a lot of anxiety and um and we understood that when you go from preliminary to final engineering there's things that come up that you know nobody knew about um that having been said i guess i'm, I'm curious if you can give us a better sense of why maybe are the the sort of whoever was hired to do the geology and analysis of the corridor um, didn't identify that we wouldn't be able to use traditional piling methods and construction methods in the corridor. 
when we went from preliminary to final, I would have thought that that would have been the place that we would have discovered that. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I understand that when we um, had our, uh, the uh, sort of bids were going out and the crash wall was identified we knew that it was an issue but uh, i think as you said today you know we didn't realize uh, kind of how involved it would be and what that cost would be i guess i'm curious if you can share a little bit more of the detail because i think for myself as a strong supporter of this project and have been for a long long time um you know i like commissioner Gattel and others are going to get questions about you know, you guys were all on the quarter management committee and you, you should, why didn't you know that, uh, you know, didn't, didn't you, didn't you talk about this? And I think getting a little bit more detail on some of those things would be, would be useful. And then I, I have some questions about kind of how we move forward, but I, I guess I want to start there. I could. Uh, sure, Mr. Mayor, or Mr. Chair, Mayor, uh, well, let's start with the, uh, the Kenworth tunnel. So, Going back to preliminary engineering and in design, we had uh, identified that we needed to do something different in terms of getting uh, the what's called supportive excavation. That's essentially the sheet piles that uh, went in so you could build a tunnel inside that excavation. And uh, due to the vibration concerns, we had to go to an alternative method. Traditionally, the sheet piles are, are vibrated in or pounded in, and that was going to be uh, too much uh, uh, disruption essentially to the Cedar Isles uh, condominium building. And so we committed to, to um, use a method to press in the piles. So back in preliminary engineering, we had our engineers looking at this. We brought in the, uh, the, the equipment supplier that, uh, that, uh, that provides these type of, type of, uh, um, of, of machinery to get these sheets in by a hydraulic uh, uh, push-in method. And uh, we looked at the, we had them look at the boring logs. We, I don't know how many borings we have through this area, but it's, it's a lot. And I don't have that number right handy, but uh, we had AET, our engineering firm, looking at uh, the soil conditions, identifying. We shared the logs with, uh, with, that, with that supplier and everybody around the table said, yeah, this can work. We can make this work. And so we continued on doing more refinement through advanced design. And our consultant AECOM had looked at it and said, yeah, we can make this work. Further conversations with, uh, with the suppliers of this type of equipment, everybody said it was going to work. When we got into it, we had, we had issues. We couldn't get the sheets in on their own uh, with just pressing them in. We had some obstructions, with, uh, just the density of the soil. That combination uh, caused that they had to auger in front of the sheets as they put the sheets in. And the result of that caused settlement at the ground surface. And that's where we said, you know, we're going to have to have some caution here as we go past the buildings, and uh, we really can't do that press in pile method, and we can't do the we can't do the vibratory method either. So we had to come up with an alternative method. That process led us to the secant pile wall solution, and we had uh, you know that really disrupted how the contractor was going to do the work. And this is while the contractor is doing doing the work, so we already have them under contract, and so there's really we're kind of in a spot where we have to figure out a solution here with our contractor, with our engineers, and came up with a secant. Um, that created a lot of challenges in terms of getting this uh, tunnel on. The secant's not right in the middle of the tunnel excavation, but it's 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 in the middle enough to cause a disruption of how the contractor was originally going to do the uh, do the work. So that's really the crux of of why we're why we got here, and because of all those elements, it's taken more long, more time to install the sheets. I think, uh, I don't know if I've got those months of time, but we had, you know, I think it went twice as long was originally bid or anticipated because of the obstructions and all the challenges of getting the sheets in with that augering. And the contractors needing more time to get this tunnel done than was originally anticipated, both, both our designers and the contractor when they bid this. And that's that's really what's driving this uh, this length of the 34 months to the work. Now the quarter protection, I would say that's still in a mix, but if you if you combine all these pieces, you put the quarter protection, the Eden Prairie Town Center, the Kenworth Tunnel, put those all in in the mix, it it the contractor is saying, hey, you know, I've I originally bid it as this, and now you've got all these pieces. Yeah. I can't do it in that time. Right. And so the quarter protection, if we were just had the quarter protection on its own, 
it probably wouldn't have been such an such an impact. Mm-hmm. But with the tunnel, with the with the station, and the productivity concerns right. that they raised, it's just a combination of all those pieces coming together that right. uh, really created the challenge. So I thank you for that, Jim. And I, you know, I appreciate it. I'm familiar, certainly familiar with that process. I used to do uh, bidding for projects when I, not a project of this scope and complexity, but, uh, you know, used to do that in the construction world. So I'm certainly familiar with uh, change orders and how that works and approvals and, 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 and all of it. I think your, your, your answer leads me to kind of one of my uh, observations, which is, or a, a further question, which is, we had a whole bunch of experts come in and, and sort of look at this and they all said that they thought it would work a certain way and it didn't. And so what what protections are in our contract that when we hire someone who gives us an assurance, um, they're held to account for that? Or uh, I, I ask because, you know, is there a way, whether it's with AECOM or any of the other consultants that we worked with, do they have any uh, accountability for having, you know, provided advice, advice that led the project down a certain path which we're now having to adjust for. Uh, yeah, I would say there's 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 accountability, uh, Mr. Chair, Mayor, on that, uh, and it's something we're continuing to work with our consultants on. Keep in mind, we we need to, we still have a lot of work to do, and I'm not going to be able to do this project on my own. I I'm not I'm an engineer, but I'm not a structural engineer, and we need we need our engineer right be, beside us to to essentially deal with issues that come up. Because on a project like this, or even smaller projects, you're doing a roof project, things are going to change from what you originally intended, what you plan to do. And we're going to need, we need our engineer beside us to essentially uh, give us that expertise to to approve things when they change. And uh, we need to continue to have that working relationship as we see this project out. We have a long road to go to get to the end here. And uh, we need to continue with that partnership with our engineering consultants as we uh, we get to the finish line on this project. Okay. Um, then let me let me just pivot. Uh, I, there, I have other questions, kind of looking back, but but as you sort of talk about moving forward, it's maybe a good opportunity to sort of pivot forward. I, what my my guess is that most of the uh, locations that you have ongoing concerns about cost increases, and you, you know, you'd said that. Right now, it's a uh, you know, change order of up to 210 million, might be less, might be more. Um, where are are most of those concerns still sort of focused around the corridor, the, the Kenilworth corridor area? Uh, Mr. Chair, Mayor, I would say the primary concern from a schedule perspective is the tunnel. It's the long lead. Secants are really that piece that's the long lead. And that's what uh, our focus is. And, you know, that's that's really... I see we are, you know, we already have, like I said, we have over 60% done. If you go out to Eden Prairie, Minnetonka, Hopkins, even your city, there's a lot of things built already. We saw some mm-hmm. freight to do, still some freight to do in, in your city and in Hopkins to get that done. But uh, but we're out of the ground on a good, a good chunk of this. It's yeah. the tunnel that's really the challenge. And the quarter protection, that's moving along pretty well as well. They already have all the foundations in on that and good portion of the walls being in. We're also having some challenges up in the Glenwood area. That's, uh, we've had some we've had some issues up there that we're working through. Uh, but uh, I would say, I would say Glenwood and, uh, and the Kenilworth are our primary, you know, big pieces to tackle yet on this project. Okay. So uh, thanks for that, Jim. So let me ask you, um, related to that, I guess there's sort of a cascading series of uh, of things that come to mind. But I, what I'm most concerned, what I'm most curious about, um, is uh, moving forward. I think that we should. I think it's our obligation for us to really take this moment to contemplate every potentiality as of ways that we can move forward on this project. And so I, I'm curious, um, you know, what conversations have been had with the state, what conversations I should say with, you know, uh, the, the legislature, or the governor's office or whomever, who, who have we talked to at FTA about our flexibility and authority? I know that there are, um, I, I do know that, you know, FTA has some authority to provide uh, work, you know, sort of approvals outside the scope of projects and give uh, projects flexibility. Um, 
especially as it relates to the tunnel area and and relooking at that because I just think that that when I look at what's going on in St. Louis Park or Hopkins and, and in other places, you know, things are moving along. I see progress. There's not a lot that's happening in Hopkins and St. Louis Park, I should say, just because, you know, there's not as much digging and bridge building that needs to happen um, in our communities. Um, but I think going back and asking the questions, you know, sort of taking a moment to sort of step back and, and I'm not saying to stop or go backwards with the project, but to really sort of assess what are all of our options moving forward and to contemplate them, um, to come up and share sort of really publicly a plan of how these are gonna be funded. I, I understand you're having conversations with all sorts of funding partners and, um, but getting that out publicly, um, sort of noting the major milestones that are still yet to be had on the horizon around costs and, and uh, project decisions. Um, and I, and I say that because I think, you know, I, I, I appreciate one of the questions I had was about public input and discussion around all of these things that are coming up. And I appreciate you're having town halls and tours and council presentations. I'm not sure, you know, when you talk about public engagement, there's lots of different levels, right? There's sort of to inform, there is to sort of um, consult, there is then also to collaborate. I'm not sure kind of what the this public outreach is intended if it's purely informative, but I think for myself, and I'm gonna volunteer myself and our city, you know, uh, in this regard, I think that we're gonna need as a CMC to be more involved in and aware of the changes that are happening and how they're happening and how they're impacting the budget. And I think maybe, and I haven't asked this of the chair, I haven't said anything to anybody really about this, but. You know, I appreciate that we've gone, we're moving to like every other month meetings, but I think maybe having monthly meetings and I think maybe having other meetings that involve uh, resources that cities might be able to bring to bear to support the work that that council is doing. I'm not suggesting that, you know, you all need to be doing this on your own, but I do think that I do worry at a higher level that this line is only as good as the system it serves. And for us to be able to move forward and build other lines, the blue line extension and all the other projects that are gonna to need to be built to make this line successful and all the other lines successful. I think there's a, a moment right now where you know people are asking questions, uh, including people who are friendly and, my, and myself included, but I also think it's my obligation to maybe be asking for a little bit more detail and a little bit more information because um, I think there's uh, questions around um, What's the next thing? And I, I wanna, I, I believe in this project and I believe in the people who are doing the work around it. Um, but I think the public and, and a lot of folks need to see that a little bit. They're gonna need to see the math, so to speak, as my teacher used to say, I need to see your math. Um, and so I would strongly encourage um, Chair Zelly and, and Jim for Met Council to sort of take this moment to really reevaluate the way they're doing engagement with their partners. Um, and how they're sharing that information with the public so that the public can feel confident um, that they got the right team at the table, which I think they do. Um, but I think they need to know that. And I think we're going to have to show them that work. So, uh, and, and as I said, I'm volunteering myself in whatever capacity. Uh, I was never good at math, even worse at engineering, <laughs> Jim. So I don't, I don't want your job, but, uh, but certainly, you know, I've done project management and other things. And I'm not looking to be in the kitchen making the stew, but I do think that we need to have some extra eyes on this that are helping and able to support and then can also explain. So uh, I want to volunteer myself and, and the team here at the city of St. Louis Park in whatever capacity we can to be uh, a part of that. Well, I, I just jump in and, and express uh, appreciation for what you've just said and offered and and asked for. Uh, I think this is a moment when we can have uh, where, where we where we really do need to be coming together, uh, understanding um, if there's decision making, we need to be having that fully within this committee um, and maybe more timely uh, showing the math. I love that. You know, uh, uh, I'm not an engineer either, but I certainly know um, that seeing the work builds credibility and uh, um, and and it's complicated. And I appreciate uh, Jim's uh, explanation, which is kind of uh, you know not covering every detail, but um, really appreciate that uh, having us engaged in this 
process uh, um, really helps us kind of understand how where where we are. And I, I'll just close by saying, you know, perhaps, you know, every other month is more of a high level meeting. And maybe, you know, the other months are more in detail, more in depth, um, and people can kind of self select exactly how they want to engage with that space. But I just think we're going to need to create uh, some opportunities for folks to to have a better uh, level of trust uh, around how the funding decisions are made and how uh, the project engineering is going and, and all the rest of it. So, hey, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. No, absolutely. And we have uh, not on the calendars every other month, but I think finding some uh, alternative kind of work sessions or information sessions, we we're certainly are open and we'll certainly uh, uh, look at that, that opportunity. Uh, Commissioner Fernando, is that your hand up? Yes, thank you. And I, I put some stuff in the, the chat, but I know some members might be on uh, the phone. So I wanted to also verbally just express and amplify what Mayor Spano is sharing here. Um, I mean, it's about trust with residents, both both keeping it and and re-earning it at times, depending upon how uh, how our communities are kind of interacting with with the current state. It, it's about uh, transparency, not only in information, but what I'm hearing from you, Mayor, is uh, you know, the, the CMC, we're in a position of, of, we're expected to be in a position of information and decision making and, and uh, perhaps that's, that's even heightened given kind of where we're at is what I was hearing and I just wanted to amplify that because um, we, we, uh, you said it much better than I will, but it, it was something to the effect of, you know, we're, we're only as strong as who we're serving and we are here to build a regional transit system that serves our residents, that connects folks to Healthcare and jobs and family and livelihood, and I, uh, I just really wanted to amplify that verbally for for uh, members who might be uh, listening in. So, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, and uh, maybe one more comment. I know, uh, uh, Patrick, you have uh, your hand up. Chairs, Ellie, uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you for that presentation, and thank you for. Uh, all the information you provided and the, and the tours you provided in on the in the project and understanding the complexity that you have to deal with in managing this project. It's really is a, a feat of engineering in a number of spots along this this transit line. So thank you for that. Um, you know, there's something to be said for uh, having objectivity uh, in the de decision making. But to uh, Mayor Spano's point, I think there's also, uh, you know, for us to be continue to be more involved in the cities that are very committed and Hopkins has been very committed to this project. Uh, and we've been excited about the project. This is obviously news that none of us want to hear. Um, you know, our residents, we are not one of the wealthiest cities along this, this transit line and our residents have been inconvenienced, uh, you know, in, in traffic, the businesses, residents, uh, trails, using, using our trails. Um, we have a, to, to not put it lightly, we have a, uh, a blight of a project. And so uh, on, the, on the Shady Oak uh, site, and so I, I was happy to hear Jim say that, you know, there's obvious work that's needed in Hopkins uh, and in St. Louis Park, as Mayor Spano uh, referenced to. So I'm looking forward to how we can have some creative solutions around if you go along the, the, the transit line, that that Shady Oak site really stands out as an area that is, um, you know, it's a storage site. Hopkins is a storage site. And the timing of this project is, much, is of as big a concern as anything. You know, we have developers that are coming in um and and making plans to develop in hopkins and pushing this out this timeline out is a really big issue for our city um and so mayor spano uh reference to assurances you know i would love to see assurances that we are going to be on time with this because you know as we push things out well are we going to hit that next target you know and and can developers count on that when they're coming to our city and we're working with uh with those developers to bring housing to our city um, and so I really just want to, I would love to be part of those conversations, our staff to be part of those conversations. I know Kristen Elvrum has done a great job from the city of Hopkins and being involved with this, but yeah, we'd love to have the information and then looking at moving forward. How do we look at that Shady Oak site and what are some creative opportunities, uh, you know, between Minnetonka, Hopkins, uh, that could be a really marquee site along this transit line. And so if we have time, if we're extending out time, what are some creative options uh, that can be taken because we are not only a not a wealthy city, we're not a big city. And so using a lot for a large open uh, parking lot where we are going to have, you know, potential security issues, 
in, in monitoring that site? You know, what can we do to creatively look at that site so that we can get some density in that parking, whatever that may be, uh, so that we can have a really marquee development on that site and can bring more riders to this line. So uh, those are just the comments that I wanted to make. And thank you for having me uh, my first time here on the on the committee. You're very welcome and great comments. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I want to leave enough time to hear from uh, Kirsten Evelyn since you mentioned her and we we're talking about some of these uh, city uh, partner investments uh, because it isn't just about transit. It is about the economic development, which you're clearly, clearly seeing Hopkins and, 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 and all of our cities. But uh, first, Commissioner Latranza, you get the last question and comment. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. My, my question, uh, uh, thanks, Chair Zelli, uh, for uh, Mr. Alexander. You, you talked a little bit about, uh, for this $210 million, how uh, we've got, you're basically negotiating a list of items with the contractor that will go to mediation and how those, that final dollar amount for those could come in higher and could come in lower. My question is sort of twofold. Number one, how is that mediation process similar to or different from the process that we currently go through in negotiating change orders with the independent cost estimates and the contractor price? And then number two, do we yet have or at what point will we have a range? In other words, uh, what's the low end of that scale if uh, you know the mediator sides with us on a number of these items? And what's our maximum exposure on those items if the mediator signs with the contractor on a preponderance of those items? Uh, sure, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. So uh, this this approach that we're going to be entering into is we'll be meeting with a mediator that uh, will give opinion on who's right, essentially. We'll have our case, the contractor will have their case. And these are on elements that we, we can't get to an agreement on. So we'll essentially try to get resolution with negotiations through with the contractor before we go to mediation. So we don't bring the whole kitchen kitchen sink to, to get this resolved. So we hope to get some some of that resolved, some of that portion of what that full amount is gonna be. But we expect that something's gonna go to mediation. So they'll give an opinion. And if we, as uh, we decide not to agree to that, then it would go through a binding arbitration process where we will be bound by that decision of the arbitrator. Uh, that would hopefully happen later. Later, Hopefully we don't have to get to that, but uh, that would be later this year. But uh, we will be coming up with our assessment um, and it's, it's a bit of part of a negotiation process, so it won't necessarily be fully public, uh, but uh, we'll find a way to communicate as best we can as we're proceeding through the process. We have our ECCB to work through, our Met Council to work through on those pieces, and we'll do our best to keep that as full disclosure as we can, understanding that some of this is under negotiation until we get to a mediator that we won't necessarily be fully public. We just have to, that's just kind of how, you know, negotiations work, but uh, we'll try to be as transparent as possible as, as we get through those stages. Does that help you explain kind of the process or? Yeah, that helps on the process. And, and Chair, Chair Zelli then does, at some point will the public know, because my understanding is for each of these items that will be going to mediation, part of what we're agreeing on is what's the maximum exposure there and what's the minimum exposure. Uh, at, at what point will that be made public, what our maximum exposure would be? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, maybe I could uh, maybe kind of confer with our legal advisor and get back to this group on how we do that process, because I'm not necessarily going to be able to speak all the legal ease on this piece here, but uh, we'll find a way. I know there's interest in being transparent as well, what we're doing here, and uh, we'll, I think I'd prefer if we could uh, maybe come back to you on that. And, and I think that's a fair comment. We're going, but as, as I understand it, uh, Commissioner, there will be a as we get through this mediation and then ultimately arbitration process to settle this piece of the project, uh, we'll certainly be able to fully disclose that as we get through that. And, and I think we can get back to is kind of what that timing and, and what we can and can't because there's some attorney client kind of negotiations that we need to ensure we get the better result by uh, uh, that happens uh, through the process. So. We'll, we'll get back on that. I want to leave enough time to hear, uh, you know, briefly 
Um, Julie uh, Wishnack, who is the Community Development Director from Minnetonka, and uh, Kirsten uh, uh, Elifram, who's uh, also with uh, the same capacity with Hopkins. And we've already talked about development, so I know we're not leaving a ton of time, but Julie, uh, you're going to start off, Kirsten. Uh, you're doing important work here, and we know that uh, <laughs> that this isn't just about trans, this is about the developments and delays cause challenges. But I see a lot of I see a lot of cranes in the air, and they're not just the project. So go ahead. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would say I would yield my time to Hopkins, actually. I'll come back another time um, because I think we only have time for one presentation. I think from Minnetonka's perspective, I have a lot of buildings to show you and a lot of pictures. And so I don't want to uh, spend too much time with that because uh, I do want to hear what Hopkins is doing, too. So just to give you a flavor, 1,400 units under construction or about to be under construction in Minnetonka, and half of those are affordable. And so really great stories to share with you. But Kristen, if you don't mind, I think we'll just focus on Hopkins today and I'll come back another time if that's okay. Julie, today. you're welcome. And we're going to have more of these meetings as we've heard and as we should. So thank you for your graciousness, Kirsten. Well, thank you. And thank you, Julie. That's really generous. But, you know, that's how we've worked together throughout this entire time on this project is really respecting each other. So, so thanks for giving me some time. I am excited to share the opportunity um, today to highlight some of the projects that we have going on in Hopkins. And if I get my PowerPoint up. You can go right to the next slide. This slide, I think, is just really telling of our story. You know, throughout my time in Hopkins, we saw a major project every three to five years. This shows the last 10 years of development, and it kind of um, mimics that, that pattern until last year. In 2021, we approved over 1,000 new housing units in Hopkins. And I think that you know this is not an anomaly. This is really something that we're going to see continue into 22 and beyond. Um, as we already have another 500 or so units that we're in discussions with uh, developers around. The next slide, the construction pricing has had a major impact on projects though. And this is a project, this to 44 by Beacon Interfaith. It actually was approved in 2019, but won't break ground until this summer. Um, we are optimistic that it will um, get under construction. It's a really unique development. It's four stories, 50 units on a one acre parcel that really sits right between the Shady Oak Station and the downtown Hopkins Station. It was owned by St. Gabriel's Catholic Church and they were willing to sell this uh, little remnant um, parcel to uh, Beacon for this project. It's going to serve um, homeless or near homeless families in Hennepin County through the coordinated entry program. They are really wrapping those families with a really high level of supportive services so we're really um, confident that's going to be a great model for how to home, um, house really um, difficult, um, you know, families find housing for, um, and they have finally, I think, cleared the financing hurdles that they've um, been trying to overcome, both um, because of construction costs continuing to rise, as well as you know the the cost of providing um, housing for the the most um, you know, needed in the community. So we're anxious for it to, to get under construction. Next slide is a another 100% affordable project that is under construction today. It's an infill development on Main Street, and it is really geared for um, workforce housing. We worked with the developer to really push those bedroom sizes up because we have heard a real significant need in our community for more moderate priced rental housing for families. Uh, this was part of a larger project where Trellis, um, he was the developer, was also in the process of trying to preserve another housing development in Hopkins called Raspberry Ridge. We provided conduit financing so they could both renovate Raspberry Ridge as well as um, do this infill construction project. Uh, just super excited about it. It fills in, you know, a real big gap on Main Street, a parking lot that um, created um, kind of a missing tooth in our downtown. 
um, will you know bring uh, housing for families and really add to the vibrancy of Main Street. And it's certainly within walking distance to the downtown Hopkins station. Next slide. Most of our work is really focused around the Blake Road Station. That's where the, the real um, significant numbers of new units are going to be constructed. We had really planned for the redevelopment of the corner of Excelsior Boulevard and Blake Road for quite some time, really over a decade of planning around uh, re uh, developing what was a very tired uh, strip center, a retail strip center into a housing uh, and commercial development. And finally, this last year, Trilogy, a developer out of Chicago, came forward with a three phase development. We did give approvals for the first phase, which is now under construction. That was about 200 uh, housing units. The second phase, we're expecting to come in this month for approvals in March and April, that will add another 250 housing units and um, additional square footage of retail. The uh, city did not participate um, financially um, except for a environmental cleanup grant that we um, awarded the project when they were not successful in, in closing the gap through the other traditional cleanup programs. Next slide. And I don't know if you uh, can all picture what this area um, has looked like, but there really has been a significant amount of disinvestment in the area. It was never really designed um, to be very um, environmentally friendly from a stormwater treatment perspective. It was all impervious surface and really posed some problems for connectivity to the station platform. So the new development will really solve a lot of those problems. Um, create much better connections from the neighborhood surrounding the Blake Road Station, um, treat the stormwater appropriately, clean up some environmental contamination. It is a market rate development, um, but you know, from our perspective, market rate housing is also needed in the corridor and it provides a housing choice that really isn't available today. Um, so we are excited about this project moving ahead. Next slide. Uh, but certainly, last but not least, is uh, the biggest project that we have been focusing our efforts on over the last year or so, and that is working on the 325 Blake Road site in uh, collaboration with the Minneapolis Creek Watershed District as owner of the property and a lattice as the developer that was selected for the redevelopment of the majority of the site. So uh, together, the site will bring 100 833 new housing units and a little under 20,000 square feet of retail space. Um, but that really doesn't tell the whole story. There's a lot going on on this site. Um, it really has many different development paths within it. There is going to be one building that's completely affordable. There will be a senior co-op building that will bring an ownership opportunity to Hopkins that we have um, long had a goal to um, realize. There will be a mixed income rental building. There's also a 14 story building that um, you can see in the backdrop of this image. That's a new construction technique that we really have not seen um, since probably the 70s in Hopkins. Um, it is a more costly way to build, but with the proximity to transit really was the way to get the kind of density on this site that we were striving for. Um, there's going to be uh, a hotel component to the top of this building, as well as a sky deck uh, lounge that will be accessible to the public um, with just fantastic views of downtown Minneapolis and, and the whole Minnehaha Creek watershed area. There will also be in future phases townhome um, units and additional retail um, that will both be in separate buildings as well as embedded within that 14 story building. The overall affordability on this development is going to be 25% kind of between different AMI um, breakdowns, kind of hitting all of the different um, touch points on affordability. Uh, really unique feature is the land that the watershed district is going to retain. They are retaining uh, several acres to do regional stormwater treatment um, that is reflected in the funding on this image as well as create trail infrastructure and really celebrate Minnehaha Creek, which 
Um, you know, as you know, the cold storage facility that was there really did not do any of that. Um, we hid the creek from um, public access, and so we're completely um, turning that around and making it an amenity on the corridor and really for the region. The city did participate with this um, project in the form of TIF, and um, we did go through the land use approvals at the end of 21. So they are um, poised to start construction on this project in 22. Um, with about a two year build out um, of many of the components. Uh, we recently got a livable communities grant um, through the Met Council and really appreciative of that support. That's going to let us um, really focus on the public realm and making sure that that is um, completely inviting to everybody who wants to come visit the site as well as use um, uh, wayfinding and I think really effective way bringing people from the station and through the site um, into the, the neighboring amenities of this area. Um, so we're looking forward on, on kind of getting into that next level of detail working with um, artists and the developer to create that um, really important wayfinding and public art component. So the, I will end with a video that the developer produced for the site, and maybe in the end we can vote whose uh, video is more uh, entertaining, Jim's or ours. If you can load the video. Yeah, there's a lot going on on the site. I, I don't know that the video um, is all that easy to kind of track through the different uh, development types within it, but I think it gives you an idea of the way we use the site to really maximize the creek as an amenity, um, drop down the density as you get to the creek and really focus um, the intensity right at the um, connection point with the station. I'd be glad to answer any questions anyone has. Great presentation. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And uh, we have a minute if anybody has a question. Go ahead, Will. Thanks, Chair and Jim. Um, two great presentations and videos. Uh, so I'm not going to geek. I'm going to stay neutral on that. Um, Two tactical questions, Jim, and if you've addressed this, my apologies. First, as it relates to um, in, um, your comment on the ability to extend in Minneapolis a little bit of the, the line for revenue opportunities, are there revenue opportunities on the southern half uh, over this delay, uh, over this uh, new timeline horizon? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, well, I, you know, maybe I should clarify. I, when I was talking to that, that was more for from a testing perspective, 
because yeah. we see that uh, you know, testing out 14 and a half miles is going to be a challenge in any event. And the more we get behind us, the better before we have to really kind of scramble to get to revenue service because that's usually how it happens. And uh, there really isn't a way of doing revenue service uh, out the West End without the linkage to our maintenance facility and uh, getting the vehicles and just uh, just the logistics of doing that would be a challenge. We're, we're still trying to work out the details of getting trains out there once the systems is all done, just do the testing. And then we have to figure out, uh, well, what if one of the trains uh, has some maintenance? How do we deal with that? So that just creates some, some, some significant challenges. In terms of revenue service from Target coming into the, the Green Line extension, you know, I don't know if that's uh, something we've really had on our radar. It's more from a testing perspective because that that piece that that uh, the connection from the extension to the existing green line slash blue line is really important. And there's going to be a lot of bugs to work out through there. And so the earlier we can get on that, the better. So and then we have the tunnel left to do. We hopefully are, we're, we're time ahead of the game to get to revenue service. Perfect. And last fast question. Uh, with the new timeline horizon, Jim, are there opportunities to address the, the parks and trails and bike paths? Um, what's the impact with, with that? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Well, so, so we are we're actually hopeful um, trying to finalize some agreements with uh, Three Rivers and uh, Twin City Western Railroad to open up the segment between, I think we've talked about this in the past, between Beltline and Wooddale. We're also looking to open up that segment from um, essentially the depot and Hopkins out to 11th. So I think those are those are on track. The, those, those pieces are constructed. We just need to get those agreements finalized. And then we're looking at uh, other opportunities. I would say the piece from Beltline up to 21st in Minneapolis are going to be is going to be the biggest challenge because that's a long lead with the tunnel. We're also looking closely at the Glenwood uh, piece, but uh, we are we are looking closely at those. I, as I said, I've, I'm a biker and I'm very interested in that myself, and so it is something that's on the radar. But uh, we're still going to need to flesh out the details on other than those other legs. You know, I appreciate we're just slightly over time. Um, and uh, there's even more information that uh, we should be sharing and will be sharing. So I just want to thank everybody for your questions, your comments. Uh, this group is so important uh, to uh, both the success and the process towards success for this, uh, this project. And I have to tell you, OK, I'm going to disclose my vote. Boy, I, <laughs> Hopkins. That's why we're doing this. I mean, if there's any more reason to think about the kind of urban placemaking vibrancy uh, that kind of result from this project, that video kind of describes it. And I have to say uh, the other part of Met Council of being able to support the project, not just with livability grants, but with uh, project vouchers uh, uh, for, how, for deeply affordable housing and access to transit is part of the whole picture we think of in this metro. So with that, I know we have a, on the calendars for another meeting on April 6th, but I've heard a deep desire for uh, additional uh, time to get together information, some cadence of accountability, I will call it, toward both schedule and the process as we go forward. Um, we will commit to that. And, um, and unless anybody has any final burning last word, uh, I'm going to adjourn the meeting, but know that we won't be adjourned for too long. Thank you again for your time today, for your ongoing support and interest, your your solid questions. And uh, there's more to present in the, in the weeks and the months ahead. So stay tuned. Mr. Thanks, Chair, everybody. Mr. Chair, I just wanted yeah. to tell uh, Commissioner Gattel, I think we're all thinking about her district, her home city of Richfield. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I had a briefing this morning already from the city of Richfield. I appreciate that. Right. Yeah, thoughts go out to Richfield. Absolutely. Yes. Many, keep them in your prayers, please. Best wishes. Thank Thanks. You. All right. Enjoy this sunny day. Thank you. Bye.